good to be back with you this this evening or afternoon, and uh, excited to uh, open up God's Word again with you at this time, and also looking forward to the rest of this week. I have some particular things chosen, particular topics chosen of, of great interest to me, and uh, things that I have been studying, and uh, I'm anxious to present those things uh, to you and, and let you contemplate them as well from God's Word and uh, promote further study on your own of these things as well. But uh, my intention is, is to be here to help, to uh, help all of us um, and to uh, allow God's Word to have a transformative effect on our life or a restorative effect on our life. And uh, so this uh, evening we're going to be looking at the concept of God's armor or Christ's armor. And when we think of the, the armor of God, what text do we think of? Ephesians chapter 6. There you go. Very good. So Ephesians chapter 6. The armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. In fact, here it is up on the board. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13. Well, this is just the be beginning of that. And we think of this passage because it is certainly the, uh, the, the, the longest and most detailed uh, uh, text concerning the armor of God. But it is by no means the only text uh, that refers to the armor of God. Uh, but let's go ahead and read the first few verses of it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And after this, he goes further into uh, taking up the uh, particular implements uh, that he illustrates in the text uh, from uh, the, the sandals to the sword and the breastplate and the, the helmet and uh, each one of these things are, are uh, an illustration, as we'll see later in this lesson, an illustration of, of something that uh, is important for our lives, something uh, that we need to have uh, on in our life. But the thing about the, the armor of God is, is it's something we know about, something we have, we've read this text maybe many times in our life, but to apply it, what, what do we do with this? Uh, how, how is this uh, something that we can practically use in our everyday life? So I'd like to kind of dig into those kinds of things, but also getting a better understanding tonight of the whole biblical message on the subject of the armor of God or the armor of Christ. I say the armor of Christ because uh, that is essentially what Paul is addressing here in Ephesians chapter 6. Because this subject of Christ's armor or God's armor is not just an Ephesians 6 uh, uh, subject. It's not just a New Testament subject. It's an Old Testament subject as well. And so let's uh, begin in the Old Testament, uh, until, and then we'll get back to Ephesians 6 in just a moment. But Isaiah, uh, in Isaiah 59, you know, let's get our bearings here and see that uh, in, we're in chapter 59 of Isaiah. Isaiah deals with a lot of subjects, but in chapter uh, uh, 53, uh, he uh, begins to talk about that suffering servant, that the Messiah and, and uh, his suffering and his death. Chapter 54, the, uh, the, that suffering servant is alive again. He's resurrected. Chapter 55, the great invitation in Isaiah for the gospel, to, for people to come, to come. Uh, because of what the suffering servant has done for us. 
And so the text continues. Uh, so this is largely m- most of the in, the end passages of uh, ending chapters of the book of Isaiah is focused on that first century uh, and the promises and prophecies of what's going to happen with Christ and, 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 and not just his death and resurrection, but also the coming of the church. We also have this, uh, the church growing in, uh, at the end of Isaiah as well. Uh, there's other things as well in the, dealing with the first century. But in Isaiah 59 and verse 14, Isaiah says that justice is turned back. Righteousness stands afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him. And his own righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. So here we have this incredible picture of God observing our state. Our status on earth, that there was no justice, that uh, righteousness was gone, and that there was no man, no man to help, no man to be an intercessor. And so the text says, therefore, God's own arm brought salvation. So this image of God coming down. And he is going to accomplish this for us. We were at a state in which we could not accomplish it. So he, in his power and his righteousness, he would accomplish it. But notice the illustration that is painted here in Isaiah. As God comes down to bring us salvation, he is putting on his armor. He is putting on his armor and so that he can... Defend and fight and battle and become victorious over the devil, over darkness, over evil. And that he can provide that victory for us as well. And the text continues in verse 18, saying, According to his deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. The redeemer coming, standard being lifted up. The strong winds, the strong floods of the enemy come in, but They cannot conquer. They cannot overcome this servant, this God who is serving us, this God who has come down to help us. And he accomplishes all of this by what he wears. And so that's the illustration is he is wearing this armor by which he can fight and become victorious over evil. So when we come back to Isaiah chapter 6, I want us to uh, see here what we uh, have already read is that Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus to put on the whole armor of God, of God. We're dealing with a, in the Greek, a personal possessive, meaning this is God's armor that he is referring to. And so he's telling the brethren to put God's armor on. The whole armor, the complete armor that belongs to God. We just saw that this is the armor he put on in the prophecy there in Isaiah to be victorious over sin, to be victorious over the devil. And now Paul is saying, this armor is now yours to put on. What God wore 
you can wear as well, you should wear as well. In fact, if you don't wear it, how can you be, be victorious? If before we came to Christ, we failed. If before we came to Christ, we could not do it on our own. We fell into temptation. We could not overcome. We could not do it on our own. Our own arms could not save us. How do we think that now that we've become a Christian, that all of a sudden we just can overcome? Now that just because we have been baptized into Christ, that all of a sudden we, we can overcome all temptation. We can overcome Satan. It doesn't work that way. We must put on the complete armor, the armor that belongs to God. What, what a, a privilege is this? What an honor this is? What a blessing this is that Christ has given us his armor. The very armor that which he was victorious, he's given to us so that we can be victorious. He says it again in verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God. The complete armor that belongs to God. That is the meaning there in the Greek. It is His and He wants you to take it up so that you can be victorious as well. Notice uh, some more things that we find in the text. Uh, back up in verse 10, He said, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of God. His might. So the emphasis here is all on the Lord and what He has given, and it's on the Lord's power. Because the, the implements of His armor are implements of His power. If you read through there, you will see that it is about righteousness, right? The breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. Well, it's His righteousness. He's the one that's righteous. It's his salvation. He's the one that's accomplished it. Uh, the gospel of peace being our, our sandals. That is his gospel. The sword of the spirit that is the word of God. It's his word. It's all his. This is his armor. And so... Be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. If we can pick up His Word and defend ourselves against temptation, if we can pick up His Word and defend ourselves against the devil, we have taken up His armor. And we are able to do what He was able to do with that same armor. It is not our strength because none of this belongs to us. It's his armor. That's why he says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So I made the comment earlier that if we could not do it in our power before we became a Christian, it's not logical to think that now that we are a Christian, we can do it. In our own power. We must take up what he's given to us. This is a war-torn armor. This is a proven armor. With a proven victory. That's, as he goes on further, he says in verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So without these things, without taking up, these implements. We are not able. We know that. We know that. We can look back at our entire life before we became a Christian and we can confess that. We were not able. But with Him, with His strength, with all this that was uh, that is His possession and His nature, He's handed to us if we put it on, if we use it, 
If we use this that is His strength and His might, now we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. In verse 13, same thing. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. What are we fighting against here? What did Jesus fight against? It's right here in the text. Not, not only in the text do we see what Jesus fought with this same armor, but we also see what we're fighting against with this same armor, the armor of Christ. That we would stand against the schemes of the devil is what the text says in verse 11. In verse 12 he says our, our fight our, uh, is, is not against flesh and blood. You know, it is, is not uh, a, a, uh, like what we see out here in the world with, with war and, and these kinds of things. It's, it's not about, uh, uh, you know, hate for uh, other human beings, other flesh and blood or anything like that. It's completely opposite of that. But our fight is with the devil. Our fight is with the, the evil powers that be, as he describes here. And he's got kind of a, a detailed uh, discussion here of this. And this is, uh, I believe this is the ESV that's here up on the board. Uh, the, 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 these rulers in the heavenly places and authorities in the heavenly places. These uh, cosmic powers uh, uh, over th this present darkness and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's a lot. I mean, that just, uh, that sounds very, very challenging. But what we must recognize here is what he's saying is that if we have the armor of Christ, we can stand against all of this. Because Jesus did it. And he accomplished it. Earlier in uh, Ephesians, he uh, mentions the principalities and powers in chapter 1. In verse 19, he says, What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? So here we go again talking about the power of Christ. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ... When he raised him from the dead, there's the victory, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above, again, here's the depiction of the victory, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. That includes all, when we get to chapter 6, what we just read, that includes all those principalities and powers and rulers and authorities of darkness. In the heavenly places, he is far above those things. And, and he's far above us as well in everything. He says every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he's put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church. So not only is he the victor over the principalities and powers... But uh, we see him as a continued uh, victor as he sits uh, enthroned far above and over all of these things. <clears throat> when Paul wrote to the Colossians in chapter 2 and verse 15, he speaks of the uh, death of Christ on the cross and he says that he disarmed the principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. And so the victory of Christ as he burst forth from the grave, a public spectacle he's made of these principalities and powers. He completely disarmed them. How did he disarm them? Well, in that illustrative or that figurative use of that armor. The armor of Christ. The armor of God. By this. By this power. He disarmed. So what we're dealing with here is a proven victory. 
from a proven armor. And that victor now has handed that armor to us with the instructions, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. We know how well we stood before. We didn't stand well at all, did we? That you may be able to stand. A proven victory, a proven armor. Let's look at some other scriptures, though, in the New Testament that deals with this illustration of armor. I'll keep using that term illustration because it is a figure. Uh, we know we're not dealing with a literal, physical, tangible armor, right? That, that would be, would be seen in, uh, in war between flesh and blood. We understand that. So we know it's an illustration. And it's important that we recognize how much of an illustration that it is because in the, the variety of texts that refer to the armor of God, the illustration changes. You know, the, uh, the, uh, the breastplate and you know, the helmet, these kinds of things, uh, they might be called different things. They might be labeled as different things. So we recognize that we shouldn't just look at Ephesians chapter 6 and say, no, you know, the, the breastplate is righteousness and, and that's it. That's all that it can be. Uh, and, you know, this is this and this is this. Uh, the, the scriptures will prove us wrong if we form an opinion like that. We must recognize that this is purely for illustrative purposes, this concept of the armor. It's a good illustration for us to recognize that we do have a battle on our hands. This is a fight. We must fight against temptation. We must fight against the devil and these principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So when we look at uh, another text, if, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 6, Paul says to the church in Thessalonica, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Here we see more application, more practical, and we'll see even more as we go through some other scriptures. But we're seeing practical application and understanding of how to use God's armor that he's given to us to be victors in this life. Now, one thing that is interesting about this text is the connection that Paul draws to the illustration of the armor of God to the idea of, or the theme, of darkness and light, or of night and day. Now, we didn't really see this exactly in Ephesians but we will see that this is a prevailing theme and a prevailing connection to the armor of God in other scriptures. That the armor of God is connected with light. And that with the armor of God, we keep out of darkness. So we understand that the practical use of the illustration of putting on the armor of God means that we are defending ourselves against darkness. So you look at Ephesians and he's talking about the, these dark powers and you know these spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places and you know it just uh, our mind is just melting just considering all of this but you come here to 1 Thessalonians 5 and other places that we'll look at in a moment and it's a lot more practical this idea that uh, that this, you know, these spiritual hosts of darkness, what we must recognize is that it's right here before our eyes. It's in the darkness of this world. To put on the armor of God is very practical. To keep ourselves in the light. 
to keep ourselves in the way of God. To be, as he says, let us watch and be sober. Let's not sleep. People sleep at night in the darkness. People who get drunk, they get drunk at night in the darkness. Let's be of the day. Let's be of light. So we must be sober. We must be watchful. He says we must put on. Here's the illustration of the armor. The, br- the breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. To just break that down. He's saying that what we must be watchful and sober. Be conscious of in our daily walk. Is to increase in our faith in God's word. Our faith in God. To increase in our love for our Lord and our love for our neighbor and one another. And to maintain and hold fast to the hope that we have of salvation. If these things are ours, we have put them on. Being watchful, being focused and sober minded. We won't allow the darkness to overtake us through the day. Let's see how Paul uses it in Romans chapter 13. Notice how strikingly similar this is to what we just read in the Thessalonian letter. Romans 13 verse 12, he says, The night, there it is again, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness let us put on the armor of light let us walk properly he's giving us practical daily applications to this armor of god illustration let us walk properly as in the day not in revelry and drunkenness not in lewdness and lust not in strife and envy so The night's far spent. We've spent enough time in the darkness. The day is here. Come into the day. Come into the light. Wear that which is not, we're not putting on darkness. We're putting on light. We're putting on God's armor, the armor of light as it's described here. Now, here is another really interesting thing about this. He gives some examples of, of how we're to walk properly as, as in the day, as in the light. But as he had said earlier here in verse 12, to put on the armor of light, then he says this in verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the difference between putting on the armor of light and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ? nothing (laughs) it's another way of saying it remember this armor is an illustration it's a figure Christ putting on the armor as it was described there in Isaiah coming to bring us salvation what did he have with him it was him it was it was himself it's all that he had. That's all he had in the world. Was his nature. Was who he was. Light. Right? John chapter 1 does such an excellent job of describing. In him was light. Put on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the same. What we are dealing with when we consider the armor of God is the attributes and the nature of God. He's given it to us. Of course, we were originally made in His image, after all. We'll talk some about that tomorrow night. But He's given it to us in His Word. He has explained exactly, He's revealed exactly who He is. Exactly. The kind of individual he is. And what he would do in in any situation that we find in this life. What kind of nature he has. 
that is described as light in God's word. So he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the armor of light. It's him. He's the armor. It's who he is. And he says at the end of verse 14, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Standing against making no provision for the flesh. Here is a text that we looked at in our first period this morning. I'd like to consider it in light of what we're talking about tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So what he's describing here is, is again that idea of warfare. And again he reminds us it's not carnal carnal warfare. This is a spiritual war. And the weapons that he's describing is these, this armor of God that we have. And he says that these weapons are mighty in God. Because they're not our weapons. Right? This belongs to him. With, without him, without his word of truth, without his gospel, we have no chance. No chance. So, mighty in God are, all, are our weapons because they are God's weapons. Because they are His very own nature that we have taken up in our life. And so by this we can cast down those strongholds. We talked about this this morning. But let's just recognize here that Paul once again is giving us practical useful applications in our life. So we cannot leave here this evening and say, I, just, I don't know how to use the armor of God. We've looked at several scriptures that have told us exactly how to use the armor of God in our life. And here it is again. Whether, you know, in our mind, pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments within our own minds, but also out there in the world, that we'd cast down the arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That we could help others as well. The armor is about helping, right? Helping others to do what is right and to turn to the Lord. And I have one last scripture for you this uh, evening. And it is 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 7. And this is just a, a, a bit of it here. You can look at it there um, in, in your lap, see it, see it uh, fuller. But uh, in verse 4, what he had said, before we get to verse 7, in verse 4, what he had said is that in all we commend ourselves as ministers of God. And so here, once again, he is um, uh, defending himself against a lot of the, um, those who were arguing against him and making up all kinds of falsehoods against Paul, unfortunately, there in Corinth. And he says that we commend ourselves as ministers of God. By what? By what do they commend themselves as God's ministers? Well, in verse 7... By the word of truth, they commend themselves as ministers. By the power of God, they commend themselves as ministers. By the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. This is something that uh, Paul, whether writing to the Corinthians to the Romans, to the Thessalonians, to the Ephesians. Paul loved this illustration, the armor. But it all began with the promise of God in Isaiah. It all began with our Lord and the fact that He wore it long before we could wear it. And He's given it to us. We can live according to His truth. 
His righteousness, His light. We can do, we can have the, His very nature about us. We can live that way. We can transform our life. I appreciate your attention this evening. And again, I'd like to extend the gospel's invitation tonight to any and all who might be here who are resolved in mind to come unto the Lord for salvation. And you know what you must do to be saved. To confess Him as the Son of God. To repent of your sins. Turn from it. Make no provision for the flesh anymore. To take on the nature of God. Be a child of God. Walk in His footsteps as His, as his child. To be baptized for the remission of your sins. To continue to walk with Him. If that describes your need tonight, then please, won't you come? All together, we stand and sing.